Hi, my name is Fionn Bowden and welcome to Extra Time, a St. Eklund's Community College GA Future Leaders podcast. Joining me tonight alongside Bevan Bowden and Mr. Briggs is a, special, a very special guest, as well as being a former Watford ladies footballer. She is a 57-time capped Irish international rugby player, a winner of two Six Nations championships, one of which she captained in 2015, and a former World Rugby Player of the Year. We're delighted to welcome Neve Briggs to this week's podcast. Thanks, sir. Thanks so much for coming, Neve. Thanks for having me. How old were you when you first started playing? Um, I didn't start playing Gaelic football until I was about 13 or 14. Um, we had been living in other counties because of my dad's job. So we actually didn't move to Abbeyside in Northern until um fifth or sixth class for me in primary school so I played a small little bit in school but it wasn't until I went to the friary that um I started playing school there so I was a really late bloomer to, to get a football but um yeah it was, it was good I really enjoyed it straight away I had never really played any team sports or anything like that when I was younger um so you know I was usually just playing with my brother is out the back. You'd be stuck in goal while they'll be hammering balls off you. But um, so yeah, I was definitely a late bloomer to that. And did you ever play camogie, or was it just ladies football? No, no, I played camogie. I played camogie with the uh, ring when they set up a team. Uh, first off, back in, I'd say, oh, I was probably two thousand and two, two thousand and three. I think when they started. Um, I trained a little bit with Waterford Camogie team just as so I had broken into the Irish rugby squad. So I kind of had to pick between both. And to be honest, I had to work really, really hard at Camogie. It didn't really come natural to me. So um, I kind of went with rugby because I think even though I was only new to that as well, I think because I came more natural and I really enjoyed it. Um, I just went with them, but I like would sit down now watch more games all the time. I absolutely it's one of my favourite sports. So a part of me regrets not giving it a good whack, but I suppose I can't really have too many complaints. <laughs> um, Neve, I just do you know one of the big things with which I were think about now, especially the government are after kind of announcing that intercounty hurling and uh, camogie are elite sports, is that um. You know, when you when you, you played in an all Ireland final for Waterford, and I suppose you played international rugby matches for um, Ireland in the Aviva. How does playing in Crow Park compare to an international rugby day in the Aviva? Yeah, I think for me, playing in Crow Park in 2010 was huge because growing up, especially when I started playing football straight away as an underage with Waterford, my aspirations were to play in an All Ireland final um, with Waterford in Crow Park. It wasn't really to play rugby for Ireland, so I think that day was really special. Like I don't know about you, but Dad used to bring us to to Crow Park to watch ladies football in two thousand, like ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand and one, where Waterford were really at their heyday. And I don't know about you, Bevan, but growing up, you know, I didn't have a huge amount of female sports stars that I could have looked up to, and the Waterford ladies footballers were really my idols. So. That day was really special. I know we didn't come out the right side of the results, but it was huge for me to play there, even <laughs> though playing in the Aviva was brilliant. Playing and, and the likes of Twickenham and all these brilliant stadiums, playing in the Crow Park was probably one of my highlights. And would you prefer playing with your own club or would you prefer playing county? Oh, definitely. I, I love playing with my club, I think. I think it's because, I don't know about you, but it's your friends, it's the girls and that you hang out with after school and, the you know, you all head off to training together. I think playing county is just another, it's a different kettle of fish in terms of, it's obviously loads of people from different clubs. Um, when I started playing with Waterford, it was mostly one, one or two clubs were really the stronghold and there was only a couple of us that weren't with them. And um, so kind of never really felt that you were in it if that makes any sense at, at times and um, so look I loved my time playing county I, I definitely did but I really enjoyed playing I started playing football with Abbey Side then the team kind of faded so I went out to play football with Old Parish and I loved that that was my favourite period because they were essentially all my friends outside of football as well so you were playing with your friends all the time yeah. and 
um, went back into Abbey side then a few years later. But um, I think club is for everybody. It's for the social player that's not very competitive. It's for a player that wants to be active and wants, wants to play with their friends. Whereas county is elite, as Shane said, and it, it's more of or Mr. Briggs, sorry. Um, it's it's just more of the um, <laughs> it's 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 you know everything is really serious. There's not much you know when you go there, you go there to work, you go there to win. Whereas when you play club, it's it's a real social thing, and I think there's a place for everybody in club, and there's not a place for everybody at county, I suppose. And like in terms of, I suppose you have Gaelic football, you've got camogie, and then you've got rugby. Um. How does the skill set in GA then prepare you to become an international rugby player? Yeah, huge. Look, I think my background in GA definitely catapulted me into that Irish squad probably far quicker than it probably, you know, it really should have. I think I started playing rugby in September and I was capped the following Six Nations. And um, it was because I had played rugby or football, I could catch the ball through like GAA and I could kick and that was a really big thing and um, I didn't know any of the laws when I started playing rugby I just knew the ball had to go backwards and just hit the opposition but I think because I had played GAA and had so much behind me and it's not just me the likes of Norris Stapleton um, Louise Galvin Emer Constantine all these girls have been capped at Irish level with rugby but have all been predominantly coming Lindsay Pete, all through GAA backgrounds and I think um when you have crossover sports, so you often get girls that have come from hockey or athletics, they don't really make that jump to Irish rugby as quickly or even necessarily do they ever. But you'd find that lots of GA players that take up rugby will jump to provincial level more definitely before and then into Irish level. So I think there's a huge crossover and a huge help. Uh, poor Fionn there is an up and coming rugby player as well, but he, unlike your, well, kind of like yourself as well, he's uh, after suffering a couple of really bad. It's a double ACL, is it Fionn? No, uh, posterior cursing and oh. ACL. And okay, so. I don't have I don't have either of them either. <laughs> we can we can definitely chat about that. But yeah. uh, come here to me, even from your own point there, Fionn, you would be like you'd be a good man now. You played a bit of hurling, a bit of football. Like yeah. how do you how do you find the GA translates at your age even into playing rugby? Oh, the football like is very good for the rugby. Yeah, like hand eye coordination, never passing the ball, catching it. It all just adds to your skill set in rugby. Like. Uh, what what Thanks. position do you play in rugby, Fionn? Uh, I I play prop and I play lock. So, so like take for example a, a prop who can who can be a baller, what we call in rugby. So somebody who yeah. has hands and and has that skill set goes yeah. way further than somebody who doesn't have that background. Yes, yeah. um, only hold on to the ball, like yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And those days in rugby, like the game is evolving so much. The days of just tucking her up the jumper and being big and strong and yeah. not being able to do much are, are kind of gone. Straight, like, yeah, like, completely are kind of gone. So if you can, you know, bring that skill set from GA into rugby, it makes it makes a huge difference. And uh, yeah. Bevan, just asking Bevan, like Bevan now would be be very modest, but she'd be hard as nails on the field. Um, Bevan, just you know the way I suppose in the last 20, 30 years a lot of so gender stereotypes would have seen like you know girls play a bit of hockey like rugby wouldn't be for girls but actually now in Camogie the rules have changed slightly so that there's a lot more physicality in Camogie and I suppose I watched the game on TV a couple of weeks ago there I watched the county final between St. Anne's and Galtier and it was noticeable how much of a better spectacle the game is with that extra physicality have you noticed any difference over the last while? Yeah, definitely. And especially like when you're going up in the ages, you notice that it does get a bit more physical. And like I used to play with the boys as well. So I'd be so used to having the more physicality. And then when you switch over into playing camogie, it's kind of like a big, completely different. But I definitely think it's better that they brought in the new rules because... Like a lot of people might think that oh, camogie isn't actually that physical, but with the new rules, people might think otherwise. Yeah, no, it was definitely noticeable, but I think it adds to the game. And to be honest with you, I mean, one of the things that would have frustrated me over the last number of years watching it was the amount of refereeing 
um, calls where the whistle was consistently blown because girls were trying to be physical, but the referee wasn't allowed flow. So, I mean, I think it's much, much better. But you think back to that All Ireland final two years ago, Shane, and I think there were 68 frees uh, in that game, if I remember correctly, because I remember uh, speaking to Anne Downs afterwards. She was the county manager of Kilkenny at the time, and like 68 frees was outrageous. Like, it's just no flow. The game. I don't know about you, Evan, but like, there's no flow of the game. A shame saying it's really stop start. It's a terrible spectacle. And girls are well able, like, so I just don't understand why it took so long. But anyway, I'm just glad, like you said, that it's it's there. Like, who was it you first started playing for and what inspired you to start? Um, I started playing with Dungarvan. For, I played for Dungarvan for one season in, uh, like, a tennis side development thing. And it, it wasn't really what inspired me. It was more to do with a bet. Um, yeah. And I... We were struggling for numbers for the football team and the rugby girls were struggling for numbers for a rugby team. So we kind of, a few of us said, if we go T, will you come out and play football with us? And that's kind of really what happened. And we were playing in December in some blitz in, in Cork and I got spotted there by a Munster coach. And um, and that was kind of it really. We started playing with Camel the following season and uh, Munster in Ireland. And that was kind of took off from there. But... Um, growing up, my dad would have been really big into rugby. He would have played quite a bit and my brothers and stuff. So it was really easy to, like, we used to go, I used to go tag along on the sideline. I wasn't allowed to play or anything, but I was able to to watch them. And um, I'm completely another sports nut. I love every sport. So it was just something new and I really enjoyed it. And, that, and that's kind of how it, like, nothing stands out as inspiring as such. I think that, that kind of came later, but... At the start, it was really just for to try and make up numbers for the football team. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what was it like when you first started playing international and provincial? Yeah, I was I was really nervous. I um the the first year I played with Munster, the, the you know you're you're going in with these girls that had just come back from a World Cup and um like I kind of only knew them like on paper as as a, as a fan as opposed to to being beside them on the pitch. So took me a while to kind of get my head around that and um, when I started playing with Ireland it was just it was ridiculous like because I it's different now we're very professional in now but back then um, you know you'd only get put up for the Saturday night so there was a girl from Carrick and Shore called Kater Lachlan dad would drive me to there on a Friday night I'd stay in her house and we'd leave at half five in the morning drive to Dublin train all day Saturday you fall into bed Saturday night and then you train all day Sunday. So that was like, I yeah. go back to go to school or go to college or work or whatever it was. So that was a big, like, that was a big adjustment. And I, I was so, you see, you like, I envy you now because you play rugby and you play rugby as a, as a kid, I presume. So yeah. like, you know, I didn't start <clears> playing rugby until I was 21. So you're, you know, I didn't know enough about the game. So I was kind of getting a little bit lost for the first season playing with Ireland because I didn't really know any of the rules or the laws, so um, it was it was hard. But as I started to kind of get into it and find my feet more, I um, yeah, look, I never looked back. It was something that I loved the the elitism, the elitism of it. I loved the fact that I was training and playing at a high level, um, and and that kind of that's kind of what drove me, I suppose. So, Neve, I suppose I, I just remember you, like you being you know, going through this rugby journey. And I think it would be wrong to think that, you know, it was so easy that it was like, oh, play for Dungarvan, then play for Clamel, then I go play for Munster. Um, and for Ireland, like, I remember there was a lot of days when, like, you'd be upset or you'd be frustrated. And I suppose a big thing for, we, we'd have a lot of sports people watching this podcast today. And, like, resilience is a big thing now with mental health. And to, to be able to take the knocks and the disappointments and things won't, won't always go right, like, could you say a bit about that, the, the value of hard work and how like, you keep working at something even though you keep getting knocked down? Yeah, absolutely. I think, look, it all sounds really rosy, but it wasn't. Like, it was like I'd be coming home from camp, James, on a, on a Sunday evening, and I'd be crying for about two days because I felt like I hadn't trained well or I was getting so lost. And um, I got my first cap against Italy and like it was a blur but then the following week we went to France and we'd never beaten them away and 
I kicked the penalty to put us ahead with about three minutes left to play. And we were down in our end goal with a scrum and I went to kick the ball out of play and I got blocked down and they scored a try from the block down and then they won. And you're over in a foreign country, you're by yourself. It was horrendous. Like, I'm not going to tell you a lie. I was like a blubber and mess for, for ages and you become very joy. Like you just want to be at home with your family and kind of shielded from that hurt. I felt really guilty that I had let people down and, um, but I came home and like your family and your friends are really good. Your support structure, they've always been that for me. And like there were really tough days, A, going up there to train and, and, and B, to play matches that, you know, we we were getting hockeyed in to a certain extent for a while for the first couple of years with Ireland until we started to win things. And um, so, yeah, I think being resilient um, is the most important thing. And I don't like to hear the word sacrifice because it was a choice that I made. I chose to work hard. I chose to be put myself in those positions. But just as much as that, I don't like the word mental weak, weaker strength. I don't. So resilience is like a word that I cling on to and it's how I coach now. I really want to be able to turn around. I would hate for someone to turn around and say, oh, you're mentally weak because, you know, you got upset or you didn't, you know, you find it hard to pick yourself back up. I think... Um, somebody that's finding things tough at any stage, be it in sports, school, life or whatever it is, um, everybody does it. Everybody has tough times and it's about how you react to them. I think that makes you resilient as opposed to mentally strong or weak, if that makes sense. So there were, there were really, really tough times, but I always went back to my one thing, my support structure as my family and training. I, I would go out to the pitches the GA pitches with a bag of rugby balls, don't tell anybody that, um, and kick, kick as far as long as I could until I was in a better space, I think. And um, I think I was all along, as a teenager, as a, an adult, even now to a certain extent, you know, self-confidence was a big thing for me. I was never confident in my ability. I always questioned why I was selected in teams with Waterford, in teams with Munster, in teams with Ireland. And... Um, I think, A, if I was to have any young kid in front of me now, I'd tell them to be kind to themselves in terms of if you continue to work hard, work hard at training, work hard at your basic skills, um, then something good will come at the end of it if you just allow yourself that kindness, if that makes any sense. I feel like I may have blabbered on a bit too much there, but I, I definitely had way more knockbacks and setbacks than I did had good times, and I think that's really important. And do you think that definitely helped you cope with injuries then? Yeah, hugely. I think, um, look, my injury history has been so well documented. I think me and Fiona are on our own little boat there heading off to the, to the rehab train. But um, yeah, hugely. I think, you know, I, the, the injuries were, they were bad. But I think if you have a goal at the end of them, that was really important to me. I always had and of the season to come back to or a big tournament to train for. And that's kind of what drove me. But not only that, I think you get a kind of a stubbornness in you. I think anybody that hits an elite stage, be it uh, county soccer for a high level club, whatever it is, um, you get a, a certain, you, you develop a certain innate belief in yourself that you are good enough, relevant to what's going on around you in terms of your injuries and, and how you're training. Um, and that keeps pushing you to be the best that you can be. And you almost become kind of thick, stubborn in how you don't want the injury to win. That's kind of how I, I used to battle it. I didn't want it to, to get the best out of me. And I wanted to be, I wanted to overcome it quicker than anybody else. I wanted to be come back better than I had been before. And as I got on later in my career, I always kind of found a little silver lining in the injuries that, I wasn't a brilliant passer at the ball at the very start and I used to work on my passing all the time when I had like the knee injury, say for example, or I wasn't always the fittest. So I always struggled with that, like, you know, big engine. And I used to work on that if I had any, like when I broke my hand or whatever it was. And I always tried to analyse games as much as I could. I would watch videos of Johnny Sexton, well, not Johnny Sexton because he wasn't really there then, but like Johnny Wilkinson, Ron Nogara, Dan Carter, I would watch videos of how they kicked, how they passed and all that kind of stuff to try and make myself a better player, even though I couldn't play, if that makes any sense. Uh, so 
what was it like to be captain on the Six Nations winning team? Uh, yeah, it was brilliant. I think um, I was really surprised to be made captain. It wasn't something that it kind of came very natural to me. And the night before the first game, you know, in traditional in rugby is that they give out jerseys and there's like a spiel from the from the coach and, and then the captain gets up and says a few words. And I was so nervous about standing up in front of people and talking to them. So I rang Shane beforehand and he told me what to say. I was over in a hotel in Italy. And um, so, it, yeah, so from where I had come from at the start of that Six Nations campaign, to be able to lift the trophy and to have been a part of that leadership, to be able for us to be able to win it, meant so much more to me than actually lifting the trophy, if that makes any sense. I felt like as a player, I had grown hugely in terms of my confidence to be able to speak to people, to be able to stand up in a dressing room, because I don't know about you, Fiona or Bevan, but like I'm definitely like a bit mouthy when the whole team work together and you're like kind of all shouting and everyone's having their say. But I don't know what you feel, how you feel about when you're in a huddle and everybody's just looking at you and you're like, oh God, what do I say? So that's kind of how I felt at the start. So it took me a while to understand how I could lead the team. I felt it was really important for me not to, to be the same as the previous leader because Fiona Coughlin was the previous captain and she was brilliant at speaking to people. Whereas... I kind of realised very quickly that I would prefer to be leading with how I played as opposed to how I spoke to people. And that was kind of how I went down it. But so, yeah, it was a really big moment for me personally, but for also for us as, as a squad, because to be able to back up a 2013 Six Nations, a World Cup semi-final in 2014 with another Six Nations, it just meant, it meant a lot to us as a squad, I think. Yeah, and uh, well, I, I suppose up until, like, well, a couple of years ago, you were the only Irish rugby team to ever have beaten New Zealand as well in the World Cup. Uh, just before we finish up on your career there, just I know we'd have a number of parents watching this podcast. And can we just, like, I mean, you mentioned dad there a while ago, but uh, could you say, could you just mention about the importance of parents and encouraging their kids to do, I suppose, really activity, sports, do anything really, and trying to get involved? Because I suppose like, there are probably a lot of days when, both of us might have given up playing only for the fact that we were kind of told, no, you're going back and encouraged and encouraged and brought everywhere. So like the role of a parent in actually their child and, the, and, the, and even your own success. Yeah, huge. I think for sure the rugby wouldn't have been a, a, probably a forerunner because I don't, I, look, Fiona, I don't know about you, but my local club was on Garvin, but I very quickly had to play at a higher level, so it was Carmel. So I had to get a lift to training every week or every night. Of, so dad would drive me up, sit in the car, drive me home. I didn't drive then, so he had to drive me to Munster training. And then he would drive me to Carrick on a Friday evening to, so I could get a lift with Kate and collect me on a Sunday evening with mum. So, um, yeah, look, there that that support, I think... I, Shane, I'd say you'd know too as well. Like that was definitely our driver in terms of he was hugely into it. He loved the fact that we played sports. So he, you know, kicked us out the door even when the weather was bad and we didn't want to go type of an issue. But mum was just as much there for us in terms of that kind of emotional support. So she was the one that would always sell us no matter how bad we played or how we felt we played. She'd always be like, but aren't you brilliant? And you're not hurt and everybody's okay. And so... It was the two different perspectives, I think, was really important for us because obviously, you know, dad was the one that went to, every, to all our games and stuff. But mum been there was a huge one, especially for me. I think maybe it was a, a female thing. I don't know. But like, you know, having mum there to be able to want to chat and just bring everything back down to ground that nobody was sick and nobody had died type of a thing, even though you were devastated after losing a match or whatever it was. And um, But it's really important too, Shane, to know that like, even if we hadn't played, like I hadn't played rugby for Ireland and you hadn't played football for Waterford, that, that you know, ability to be able to, to push us out the door to, to play sports was just as important for club and, you know, any sort of activity. I remember as a young child, dad teaching you how to kick off a rugby tee inside the kitchen and go away, mum having a heart attack. Like, they were always really important. They always supported us. And I think that was... So that was probably what, you know, what pushed us into sport in the first place, but also kept us going. As you say, there were definitely days that we probably didn't want to go, but um, I won't tell the story of you playing rugby as a child. But, um, but yeah, so I do think that was really, you know, I can't, 
that's why every interview that I have had to do since I started playing rugby or whatever it was, I always make, make sure that we mention, I mention a mom, dad, but also the family itself, because I think that's what, that's why you play, I think, isn't it? That's why you, you know, you obviously want to win and you want to be competitive, but you also want to have, know that no matter what happens, you walk through your front door and that support is there. And I think that's the most important thing. Well, now that I'm getting embarrassed, I'm going to embarrass the other two here because I have to admit, two good young sports people and Bevan's mother never misses a school game. She's always there. And uh, Fionn's mother is a teacher in the school and she's his biggest supporter. So there, there's no, like, it's no coincidence that the both of them are fantastic young sports people. Uh, Ireland versus Italy. Like, what do you think about that game, Niamh? What? what do you think? Ah, uh, I'd say Ireland have a fairly good chance of winning it. Like, they're a decent team. Yeah. Compared to and would Italy, you, like. and would you have selected anybody that in or unselected anybody that's in there that that you wouldn't have had, or would you have somebody that's not in there in there? Ah, uh, I don't know. I he's like selected fairly well. Like, yeah, I probably wouldn't make many changes. Yeah. No, I agree. I think. Definitely one of the strongest Irish squads. I think majority of them are are there on form. The likes of that back row um, are you you know it's a very good balanced back row, and I think yeah. that's where the makings of that win will be. Um, I'm very 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 excited to see that second row combination of Ty Byrne and James Ryan. Um, and yeah, I think it's exciting. I I would love to see. Uh, Jacob Sackville exploded into this game as a fullback. I think there's been a lot of question marks about him as a as a fullback because his positioning hasn't been great. Um, but in saying that, Italy, Italian rugby's on the way up. I think they're now starting to see the fruits of the labour of the last few years. They have a very good young ten starting this weekend, and um, traditionally the likes of Treviso, Zebra, these Pro 14 Italian clubs are starting to get stronger and stronger. So um, I do think Ireland will win. I think the home being at home is huge, um, but I'd like to see them win without as little box kicks as possible. Yeah. And uh, Italy and England, who do you reckon would win that? Uh, I think England will win. I think, um, yeah, it's actually hard to know. i tell you why. England it, England are now are training now on, on a small squad because the likes of Wasps and Exeter, are still, they, they played their final this Saturday, so the following yeah. week. They'll have only had those players back for a few days. And the likes of the Bristol boys that have been uh, training and playing re- unbelievably well have, you know, been out celebrating all week after winning that European Challenge Cup last week. And then the likes of the extra lads won the Cham- Heineken Cup, Champions Cup last week, potentially win uh, a premiership this week and have had no chance to celebrate or will only get a day or two to celebrate. What kind of condition do they come into England with? I think if Italy put in a good performance this week, they could definitely go and try and spoil something, but I, I, I do fear that England would be too, too strong. Yeah, I reckon it, like Italy, they could give England a run for their money. I do, match, I right? do too. I, I, I'm, Shane probably doesn't agree, but I, I, I really do think that, that Italy could be good for this. They could be, yeah. they won't win, but they'll make it close, I think. Yeah. I definitely do not agree. Um, yeah. I, like with Ireland, I think Ireland really should, they should like be. Putting Italy to the sword this weekend. It's an awful. It's an awful shame that um, Ronan Kelleher is injured. I, I think like I think they've been screaming out for a, a more mobile um, hooker for the last few years. Roy Best, great guy, great captain. But to me, I actually didn't realize he was injured, Shane. I thought he just wasn't yeah, selected. Like I, I think Ireland have had they've, they've had a massive miss since Jerry Flannery uh, retired in terms of all around the park. Like you see what other hookers are doing for other international teams, Jamie George, for instance, for England. And it's, you, you need more. Um, uh, like, I, and I, I definitely think that Ireland, in the last couple of years, Dan Levy's been a huge miss. Again, another guy who can play, like he's, he's basically all three back rows rolled into one and he's a link player. Like Will Connors, to me, excellent defensive number seven. But I think you need more than that. And like, it'd, it'd be interesting to see if he can evolve his game over the next few weeks. Um, CJ is CJ. He does what he does. So like, um, but definitely Ty Byrne. Like Ty, Ty Byrne is, is a man to me that, again, he's a back row playing the second row. Uh, you worry about some of that back row when you're playing France in a couple of weeks' time in terms of bulk. But if they can move, if they can move the French around the park and play a bit more expansive game, to be honest with you, 
that box, it, it, like if Ireland wants to evolve, they have to get rid of that box kick. It's an absolute shambles at this stage. Like Conor Murray, but like Conor Murray, I'm not even sure Conor Murray at the moment deserves his place playing for Munster, never mind Ireland. Uh, but like you're kicking the ball away to top class teams and all they're doing is smashing it back on top of you. And that was fine maybe three or four years ago, but now it's time to evolve. And like, I, I still don't understand why they haven't given Andrew Conway a shot at full back. Uh, like, to me, like Stockdale is safer on the wing than he is in full back. Uh, like, Keith Earls would be a massive loss to Ireland, both defensively and attacking. Um, but like, look, it's a good warm up game for Ireland this weekend, but like, they're bigger fish to fry, and especially coming in those November internationals. Yeah, uh, what uh, Andrew Conway, I re- like, I reckon he's one of the most underrated players with Ireland, is it like now? 100% just... agree. I the only thing is, is that there must be something that nobody sees him as a fullback. Shane, I agree with you, I think he's the best fullback in the country 100%. Every time he played there for Munster, every time he played there for Leinster before he moved out to Munster, I thought he was brilliant. But there must be something that he that they, they, they just don't see. Maybe it's the fact, you know, it's his kicking game or lack of. I still think he can, he can hammer a ball up the wing, but um, I do think, I think he's very much, he's had to work hard by this time, be patient to get into that Irish squad, and I think he's more than merited his, his position in there. I'm really excited to see Hugo Keenan. This kid's unbelievable, and I actually would have played him at fullback before I would have put Jack, Jacob Stockdale in there. Um Really good player, lit up the school scene, was brilliant for the Irish Sevens for a couple of years. And um, yeah, he's he's electric. But this is the thing. We've always had really electric wingers that we've never managed to bring into the game. So it's going to be whether we can evolve our game plan that the wingers and the fullback come into the game more than they do. Yeah. Yeah, you'd nearly want a pair of gloves playing on the wing, I think, for Ireland at times. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, I, I kind of feel sorry. Keith Earls, to me, is, like, he's one of my favourite players. Like I'm, I feel so sorry for him playing for both Munster and for Ireland, where the ball rarely goes past, like the twelve. 12. Like, even Gary Ringrose hasn't shown like he's good. He, he's getting on well in broken play, but like I mean, when you consider the ball, how how quickly the ball got from Stringer to O'Gara to O'Driscoll to attack the outside channel in those years, and you you, you rarely see Ringrose get a chance on the outside to take on anyone because it's just so slow. And like what you would give for Peter Stringer now. And that's why I think your man Casey, uh, like Jemison Gitzkin Park is another one. Like I, I can see, unless Conor Murray improves drastically over the next, like in the next two or three games, I, I can actually see him being nearly out of the squad come. The yeah, end. he. this is, I yeah. imagine this is his last, his last shot of it. Yeah. Um, I suppose the next one in the, the big, like Wales Scotland is a very intriguing game, isn't it? I suppose that Finn Russell is back as well. Yeah, hugely. I think um, it's actually a really good well squad that's out for a French game this weekend. I think they're 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 strong now. I do know that Ross Moriarty's got out injured just late today, so he'll be a big loss for them because it they're a bit like Ireland. They don't have a huge bulk, so I think Justin Tipperick and Will Connors are almost like a like for like in terms of their defensive display, but then don't offer much in attack, and I think Wills will definitely miss them. So. The Welsh Scotland game, yeah, hugely. But the, the issue, Ben, is that can Finn Russell play to the structure that Scotland want? So, bit rassing, he gets basically a blank sheet and just says, go and play what you see in front of you. Whereas, well, he cost, with Scotland. He probably cost him the game last week for rassing. Yeah. Crazy yeah, pass. yeah. Yeah. With Scotland, he probably doesn't have that. Um, so, and to be fair, Adam Hastings played really well for Scotland under Gregor Townsend in terms of he has a little bit of off the cuff, but he's also played the structure that they want. I think the, the issue with Finn Russell is that he finds it difficult to play in any sort of structure. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether he gets a shot, does he get much game time? And if he does, you know, does he start by the time he gets to, to that Wales game? Yeah, like I suppose Wales probably had a bit of a hangover last year with the fact that Gatlin was gone and they're trying something new, but like they're still highly effective. And can I also say, I must commend like Alan Wynne Jones, 148 caps uh, coming up next week. Like that is outrageous. And he's a phenomenal player, a bit like Johnny Sexton. I'd say he'll probably wait for the chance to go on one last Lions tour before he probably packs it in as well. Yeah, very hard to see him. Well, he, he, may, he may go to the next World Cup. I've been around before. Uh, very rarely though, Bevan, isn't that right? But um, uh, yeah, like so, 
but they're very exciting. Like you know, they have like Liam Williams, uh, John, like Jonathan Davies. They, they have some serious, serious ball, uh, ballers in their squad, and they they always seem to be able to put it up to Ireland, especially. You know, they're really bogey team for us, but at the same time, um, Scotland definitely could take them. But I think the game is in Wales, so you know you'd, you'd have to fancy the Welsh, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. And they have this, this young kid from, from Gloucester on the wing as well. And um, I think it's, his surname is it's Double Barry when it's like a Zimmer yeah. something. And um, he's class every time. I, I saw him live against Munster last year in, in Gloucester and I thought he was, he was brilliant. So, um, but look, Alvin Jones makes them tick. He's their leader. I don't know how anybody can get to 140 odd caps in the second row is beyond me. He obviously looks after himself so well. While he's their leader in, you know, in the forwards and, and the team spiritual leader, Jonathan Davies is their go-to man for everything. And, um, you know, when you can insert Brian, Brian O'Driscoll in a certain team, um, you, you know you're definitely that good. And so, yeah, look, I think the big thing for them is outside of Dan Bigger, they don't have much creative tens and, and they struggle that sense. So um, they need him to stay fit. But, yeah, look, I, I, I would fancy Wales for that. Then there's France and Ireland in Paris next week. Uh, well, what do you think of that one then? Yeah, I, th- I think it's going to be incredibly difficult for Ireland. I think uh, even look at that French squad this weekend to play Scotland, I thought um, it looks incredibly strong. Um, I think Dupont is probably the best nine in the world this side of the he- this hemisphere anyway. Maybe Aaron Smith might just jump in the small bit, but I think he's absolutely class and um, he has a really good relationship with, with Nentemek. And in France, the their, their main, like in, in Ireland, in England, in Wales, their main player is the 10. They're the ones that control everything. They control the forwards, they control how, how the tempo is played. In France, it comes after nine. And that really suits the two boys. So they, they can, um, and, you know, they can control it the way they want. And, um, I think the likes of Hey Tama, these lads, they have they have a huge amount of flair, and it's all they want to do is play, play, play. Like so, if you can if you can drag them into kind of a dog fight, they won't want it. But like this weekend, Camille Shaq and you know he's probably he's a brilliant, brilliant hooker. He can he, you know he's on the bench, so they have him to unload once they get to the Irish game, and um, they're incredibly physical at home. They're incredibly difficult to beat when they're playing at home. Now. No crowds makes it a different type of game, but it's hard to see it. What do you think, Fionn? Uh, like, I reckon the same as you, really. It'd be a tough match, yeah. and I'd say it'd be fairly close, but... Yeah, Fra- France know. are good. It's, it, they just... Yeah. They, uh, you, you know, and we, we speak about all these players, and we, we haven't even spoken about Bakatari yet. This unbelievable yeah. beast of 13 that nobody can stop because he's just so quick. He offloads... Of it, of of both sides, and he's when he's on, he's almost unplayable and and undefendable, and um. So yeah, Ireland could be in for a tough day, aren't they? Yeah, even yeah. even even when they're poor, France are good. You know, yeah. like, I mean, but especially at home, if if they were coming to the Aviv and in no form, I'd say you'd expect Ireland. But people forget that even in the Grand Slam year a couple of years ago, like a last second. Hail Mary drop goal by Johnny Sexton when Ireland actually was should never have even probably been in that game they were so poor and like you know Keith Earls caught that cross field kick as well like it was stuff of legendary you know legendary stuff so like I, I can't see how Ireland are winning this game unless you know and, and as the years go by as well France are kind of they're getting a little less flary but like they're they're bigger they're stronger they're 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 they're, they're basically animals and like then you, you throw in what you like Vakatawa, you throw in now they have a bit more can as a 10 with them to Mac, a Teddy Tama. They could pick one of probably five class fullbacks, DuPont. And all of a sudden, you kind of look at them going, why aren't these guys more consistent? And why aren't these guys one of the favorites for the World Cup? That's the kind of talent they have. So I think Ireland, it would be a serious result for Ireland to go over to Paris to win. So, but as always, I would actually, I think now that the, the World Cup kind of seedings have been done, I actually wouldn't winning is not the I don't think winning is the be all and end all for Ireland in that game or in in November. It's more trying to evolve their game over the next two three years that they can go and compete at the World Cup because like like you said earlier on that box kick. I mean that that's not going to beat any 
good of the good teams that, that you're just coughing up the ball to top class players like New Zealand will cut you open France will cut you open England will cut you open um, from return balls so like I prefer to see that I, I take the loss to see evolution yeah 100% I think Ireland have to start getting a balance now so we're, we're not you know traditionally big so we're not hugely physical and I think um we've got to try and find a way around that. So the likes of the Vinopolas and, and, you know, Jamie George and these lads aren't smashing us, but we can compete to a certain extent at that level and then have something else in it. And, you know, the box kick was brilliant in 2018 slash 19 when we were, you know, winning. And he, he, But as you say, like, teams have evolved, defences have evolved, so we have to evolve with it and... Um, it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see. This is the first time that they've had a prolonged period with Andy Farrell now and Mike Cat and, and and what happens there. And I think the next three, four or five games head, heading into next year's Six Nations, you'll know kind of what they're trying to do with whether they can execute. Yeah, like, I mean, look, I think that the days you have to, some of the players as well, I mean, look, I love them. I absolutely love Peter Romani and I love CJ Stander. But like you kind of start to question the way world rugby has gone. Like a better defensive line out operator in the world, there probably isn't than Peter Romani. But then he offers you very little ball carrying going the other way. Now he is very good on the ground and very underrated. But like you kind of need to you need a bit of everything. Like we don't really offload as a team. So therefore we can't get in behind. I mean, if Ireland, I I genuinely believe if Ireland, I've been saying this for eight years now. Like I, I'm not detracting Joe Schmidt, and I, I never give out about him. But I was one of the people who, you know, were saying that they needed to evolve their game even when they were winning, because I felt that like that against the likes of New Zealand, like South Africa, England, even against Wales, you're not going to consistently beat the, the best teams in the world by just kicking the ball away and running after it and hoping for them to make mistakes. And like what's very noticeable as well in the last number of years is, okay, you might you might pick off a lot of these teams in say November or maybe a, a test in June. But when like Ireland have had more time together than pretty much any other international team in the world. But then when the other teams, like for instance, you had Japan and like even some of the, you know, the Pacific Islanders, when they have pr- prolonged periods together before World Cups, for instance, they can iron out a lot of the difficulties that they, they only have a week before playing Ireland. And like, they're all much better at the World Cup, yet Ireland have consistently failed so I believe that if Ireland want to, you know, push on, they're going to have to clearly evolve their game. And Bevan, a few more GA players. So um, what represents progress for Ireland heading into the November internationals? Like, Yeah, I think it's progress. You know, what? it's not really about results. As James said earlier on, you've got to see an evolution in the game plan. You've got to see more players being, being blood into that system in terms of um, Benin, Richard Lee, these kind of guys, Craig Casey, give them a run. You'd like to see um, a different type of attack mindset as opposed to what we've traditionally kind of got used to with Ireland over the last few years. Um, defensively, Ireland have been quite strong. It's, their system seems to, to work for them under Andy Farrell. But for him now, he's moved on from a defensive coach into head coach, so he's got to put his own stamp on it. And I think that will only happen in time. But so these November games, because they don't represent anything, are a perfect time for that. So it's not necessarily wins that would they be looking for. I think it'll be game time for for new caps and try and blood them into the system as quickly as they can. And then also an evolution of, of how they play. Yeah. As we come to the end of the show, I'd really like to thank Bevan, Mr. Briggs, and especially Neve Briggs for coming on the show. Next week, we will be re- reviewing Watford versus Cork in the Munster Senior Hurling Championship, and we'll be joined by another very special guest. Hit, please hit that like and subscribe button, and see you all next week for extra time.